and I just want to tell you a little bit more about uh, Lauren Klein and I's book, State of Feminism, um, because I feel that it's, uh, it's relevant for really all communities who are thinking about how to use data science and more justice oriented and liberation oriented and equality oriented ways. Um, and so this was co-written and I just wanna say, for, I'm, I'm, I'm the only one here representing us, but my colleague Lauren Klein is a, an amazing academic. Um, you can follow her work um, on Twitter and also through the Digital Humanities Lab and she's based at Emory University in Atlanta. And then the, the one other thing I will say is that the book is open access, so it's free. You can go just Google it and you will find it online. You can read it for free, give it to students for free. And um, we are working uh, together with my then who's here and some colleagues on a translation into Spanish. Um, and for the Portuguese speakers in this audience, there's actually going to be an official Portuguese version that is published as well. Um, so that's, that's in process. Um, so I just wanna take a moment. In the US, uh, we are increasingly acknowledging the lands that we occupy as uh, stolen lands. Um, so I just wanna acknowledge that the lands I'm coming to you today from um, are the traditional unceded territories of the Wampanoag Nation, and the Massachusetts peoples. Um, and so increasingly uh, indigenous rights are coming more to the forefront of our conversations and within our universities as well. Um, and so the text that you're looking at, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but this is uh, one attempt from my institution at recognizing what it owes to the indigenous peoples of, of North America. So let's get started. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about data feminism. Um, and I wanna explain a little bit about our motivation for, for writing this book. So we see data feminism as part of a growing body of work that's trying to hold corporate and government actors accountable for basically making sexist, racist, classist data products. Um, so depending on how much you're following these conversations about algorithmic bias or data bias, um, you may have heard of these things. Um, these are things like face detection systems that cannot see women of color, hiring algorithms that demote women, like resume screening applications that demote women's resumes, child abuse detection algorithms that punish poor parents and more. Um, and here at the bottom of the screen, you can see some of the, oopsie, you can see some of the projects that um, were really important for us and that we write about in the book um, as, that have done very important work on these issues. Um, because the thing is these examples of biased data science, biased algorithms, they just keep coming. And it was one of our motivations for writing the book because at least in the United States context, what was happening is like almost every week, sometimes every day, there was a new story in popular press that was coming out and saying, you know, oh my God, the, the soap dispenser is racist or oh my God, the risk assessment algorithm is racist. How could this be? These are just technical artifacts. These are just computers basically. How, how could they be racist? Um, and Lauren and I wanted to step back and say, well, in fact, if you adopt a feminist lens, then this bias in our information products from a biased society is very predictable. <laughs> like we wouldn't expect otherwise <laughs> because we live in a sexist and racist society. We would expect our information products to also kind of be re, uh, re-inscribing those same biases. Um, and so we wanted to do a little bit of more of like a root cause analysis and explain like why, why should we expect our information systems to be biased and what can we do about it? Um, and so one of the things we felt like we needed to push back on was this metaphor of data, which you can see here. So this data is the new oil. Um, this has been circulated over the past decade or so by many, many different venues, typically corporations, uh, neoliberal magazines like The Economist and so on. Um, and so people have said this constantly, data is the new oil in the sense that for them, it seems like an untapped, you know, quote unquote, natural resource 
that can lead to profit once it's been extracted, refined, mined, processed, and then uh, deployed out in the world. But in fact, uh, what we and what the other folks on this slide, along with many other people are now saying, um, is that data, in fact, it, it may be the new oil <laughs> because it, it actually is a good metaphor, right? If we think about what is oil, oil is an extractive industry. Um, and so in fact, what data are doing um, is enacting the same forces of oppression that we already see at work in the world today. So in fact, data data is not really so new. It is just uh, uh, accelerating and exacerbating the same old oppression that have been that has been faced by many groups of people for quite some time. Um, and what we explain in the book is how feminism and how intersectional feminism in particular, has been focused on dismantling instances of oppression and the forces of power that cause them for a very long time. So feminism has a lot to bring to this conversation. But so whenever and I, uh, Lauren and I talk about uh, the work, we like to be really clear about uh, which definitions um, of feminism that we are drawing from. Uh, as you all may know, not all feminisms are the same. There are many different branches and strains of feminism, and, and that is one of its strengths, in fact. Um, but I would say I want to ground you in the definitions that we are drawing from. Um, so first of all, feminism is a belief, um, meaning that uh, we believe that all genders should have equal rights. Uh, that's like the basic starting point of a, a kind of feminist project. Um, and so if you believe that all genders should have equal rights, then all you have to do is look at the world around you and see that those equal rights are not realized in the world that we live in today. Um, and so a feminist commitment uh, necessitates political action to achieve that world where all genders have equal rights. So we have to take action to work towards that world. Um, and then thirdly, feminism is um, an intellectual heritage, meaning it's an academic field of inquiry uh, it's a set of theories and ideas that help us understand and challenge unequal power. So like we don't have to invent everything from scratch to theorize data and power. A lot of that theorizing, a lot of those great ideas, both from scholars and from communities uh, are already existing and we can draw from them. And then this brings me to the idea of intersectional feminism. Um, this is really core to the data feminism project. Um, this is work that comes to us from the work of women of color feminists, um, black feminists in the United States in particular. Um, and here intersectional feminism is really at its core concerned with questions of power. Um, so groups like the Kambahi River Collective um, formulated this idea of interlocking systems of oppression. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw is the one who actually created this term, intersectionality. Um, these are frameworks whereby we can understand power not only as, say, sexism or patriarchy, um, but how sexism and patriarchy may intersect with other forces of oppression, such as white supremacy, uh, such as uh, classism, such as um, colonialism, such as imperialism. Um, so intersectional feminism is looking at these intersections to try to understand the uh, multiple complex ways that forces of power structure our everyday lives. Um, and so it's a very important idea for us, which, you know, the takeaway from this is that um, again, many people come thinking feminism is only about women or it's only about gender. Intersectional feminism draws us um, out of only those things and thinking about it's really about power and understanding how power works. Um, and in today's world, data is power. I mean, we see that in just a very material way um, in the forms of who, which companies have the most money. <laughs> These are the companies that are uh, have the resources to collect, store, maintain, analyze, and deploy large data sets and data systems. Um, and so the fundamental argument of the book is that intersectional feminism, when it's applied to data science, 
it can help that power be challenged and changed. Or in other words, we can work towards these more liberatory projects of justice, uh, equality for all genders. Um, we can do that through data science, but we have to do it with a lens of power. So uh, the book is structured like this. We have uh, seven principles of data feminism. And each of these principles, we take a chapter in the book uh, to sort of review those principles, uh, explore what kinds of feminist ideas we were drawing from to formulate that principle. And then we try to give lots of examples and stories of how people, real people who are working with data and data science are actually doing that principle in practice. Um, and here our goal was to try to speak to folks who don't necessarily have a background in feminism or have never taken a class in women and gender studies. So we try to introduce uh, some of the really excellent thinkers and feminism who at least have been inspirational for us. Um, and then we try to introduce folks to um, projects that use data and data science uh, to actually do these things. So I don't have time to talk through all these principles today, it's so short, uh, but I just want to give you a couple examples of uh, the projects that we talk about in practice. So for example, uh, in the first chapter, which is about examining power, we talk about projects like Mimi Onuoha's Library of Missing Data Sets. Um, so this idea of missing data sets is a term coined by Onuoha to describe data sets that a reasonable person uh, would think that these should exist uh, because they address issues of pressing need. But for various reasons, these data do not exist. Nobody is collecting these data sets, they are missing. Um, and so she has things on her list like trans people killed or injured in instances of hate crimes or people excluded from public housing because of criminal records and so on. Um, so Onuoha is in fact an artist and this is actually an art project which you can see it here on the left. Um, the way that it's exhibited is in this white filing cabinet and you go as a viewer, you go up to the file cabinet and you page through the files. Um, and at the top of each file folder, is the label for the missing data set. So it might be like trans people killed or injured in instances of hate crime. And then you can actually like take the file folder out of the cabinet, open it up. Um, but of course, when you open it, there are no records inside. The file folder is empty um, because the data are missing. And so the reason they're empty is because of this profound imbalance of power with respect to data collection in the world today. So think about who has, data are tremendously expensive to collect, to maintain, to mobilize. Um, and so there's a real imbalance of power in terms of who has the resources to be able to do that. Who frames the research questions? Who determines what we will measure and what we will not measure? Um, and you know, a lot of times, if you all are following these conversations about algorithmic bias, there's a lot of conversations right now about de-biasing algorithms or de-biasing data sets. Um, but what Mimi's project asked us to do is to like back up a little bit in the process and think about, well, we can't de-bias a data set that doesn't even exist, right? There's a more fundamental problem upstream, which is that we're not actually collecting the data that matter the most. Um, so next, I want to talk about an example that comes out of the chapter two, which is about challenging power. Um, and this has to do with feminicide uh, in Mexico um, and in other countries. Um, but this one relates to Mexico. So this is another case of missing data sets. So in the book, we tell the story of Maria Salguero. And she sort of de decided to head st straight towards this problem of missing data and collect the data herself. Um, so feminicide, as probably many of you in this conference know, I usually explain this for a, for a U.S. audience, but um, feminicides are gender-related killings of women and girls. Uh, they include cis and trans women. Um, they are legally defined as crimes across Latin America. Almost every country in Latin America has a law regarding feminicide. However, um, in almost no cases does the state actually systematically collect data about feminicide. So there's laws on the books, they're supposed to collect data, 
they don't collect data. Um, and then, and, or the end, or they may not make it available. So this is the subject of emerging public anger in Latin America, as many of you probably know, you may know the hashtag meet una menos. Um, and so Maria was frustrated by this lack of action, this lack of implementation. Um, and so she started collecting feminicide cases by logging them from media reports. So she spends around two to four hours a day uh, she logs feminicides from media reports, from uh, WhatsApp groups that she participates in. She now gets many crowdsourced tips as well. Um, she spends hours a day and then logging them in her database and putting them on the map that you see uh, in front of her of you. Um, and so using her data and her database, she's helped families locate loved ones. She's provided data to journalists and NGOs. Um, and she's testified in front of Mexico's Congress multiple times. Um, and so in the book, Lauren and I frame this as a form of what you can call feminist counter data. Um, and we can start talking about like a counter data science. And this is the kind of activist data collection that steps in when the state and other institutions have systematically failed to ensure the basic safety of their population. And so this is one way that we can think about using data to challenge power and to hold the state accountable. Um, if there is an important caveat here to make, which is that uh, for any given problem of social inequality, the answer is not always to collect more data. Um, so there's important uh, questions to think about if you're collecting data about marginalized groups and you're making that data visible to say the state, or to other institutions or groups um, who may use those data to target marginalized groups, there are really strong reasons to be very careful about collecting data as well. Um, and this is just a brief sidebar to say that um, inspired by Maria's work, um, I've started working with Elena Suarez Pal and Silvana Fumega on this project called Data Against Feminicide. Um, and you can go check that out. That's actually the, the work that we're doing is the subject of the next uh, book that I'm writing. And we we have lots of events um, and lots of folks. We invite many people to participate in those events. Um, so I'm noticing the time. I'm going to try to speed up here. <laughs> um, so let me see. I want to say um, here. Um, I want to problematize a bit. I want to get to talking a little bit about data communication because one of Lauren and I's goals with this book was not only to talk about the side of uh, collecting data or analyzing data, sort of what methods do we use for that, but also to think really carefully about how we communicate data. And so um, this relates to the chapter that's about elevating emotion and embodiment. That's the, the principle that we're talking about. Um, and in an Anglo Western context, We've been taught that reason is somehow better than emotion. And we see this play out in our data and in our data visualizations in particular. Um, so often when we visualize data, uh, the sort of best practices include this very clean design, a minimalist aesthetic, a kind of neutral titles and um, presentation. Um, but in this chapter, we ask why. So why are these our best practices? Why do we favor this very highly neutral, minimal way of communicating? Um, and, uh, and there's this research here that talks about kind of uh, even communicating data in this supposedly neutral and objective way actually involves a kind of uh, imbues visualizations with this aura of objectivity. Um, and the researchers in this particular paper focus on four conventions that kind of lend data visualizations that sort of authority, the, the authority of objectivity. Um, and so in this chapter, Lauren and I will say, what about the opposite? What about visualizations that deliberately draw on emotion? And this next example helps us explore that. Um, and so this visualization is uh, screenshots of an animation uh, this depicts the number of gun-related deaths in the United States in 2018. Um, each of the people killed by a gun in that year is represented as a single arc. So that one arc is one person's life. Um, this unfolds over time. So the um, web page starts drawing these arcs as the people who have died from gun violence. Um, and it's quite overwhelming to watch. Um, it's, really, it's really overwhelming. Um, 
and they tabulate the statistics as the animation keeps going of how many people were killed and also how many years were stolen from these people, but also their families and their communities. Um, and so I wanna say when this visualization came out, it was viewed with a lot of suspicion by the visualization community because it made us feel, it's a visualization that is framed around loss, around death, around the number of stolen years and the impact of those stolen years on families and communities. Um, but a feminist approach here would say that this is not a problem at all, that it made us feel things. In fact, it's a more compelling visualization because it blends reason with emotion. And when we can rebalance reason and emotion in our data communication toolbox, this opens up uh, more possibilities, lets in more voices and ultimately makes it more accessible. So I wanna wind up there, we're running out of time. Um, just to make one more point, which may be very obvious from the examples I've showed you, but data feminism really re requires an expanded definition of data science. Um, our data science isn't defined by the size of the data set. It's not defined by the credentials of the people undertaking the work. These are things that are continually used to exclude women and people of color from the field. Um, but if we expand our definition of data science and what we're interested in is data science in the service of justice, then we can clearly see that some of the most exciting work today is being done by artists, by journalists, by humanists, community organizers, librarians, and activists. Um, and it takes many forms. So it could be like academic research papers, data sculptures, data-driven journalism, and even community data murals, which you can see here. Um, so we have lots of examples like this in the book. Um, and we tried to sort of tell lots of stories in the book and give lots of uh, ideas for, for what it might look like to use data science in the service of feminist goals. Because while we recognize that data can be, is at the root of many problems today, it also can be part of the solution. So thank you so much. And uh, thanks again for the invitation to speak with you all today. Thank you so much, Catherine. I mean, the book is awesome. You should all read. Um, there's one question in the audience. Um, it's the same. Do you think the negative stigma related to the word feminism has dismissed with a greater representation of feminism in the media or in society? Yeah, so this is complicated. Um, you know, we got this question a lot, not this particular question. We got the question a lot from more from the technical community, like why did you use the word feminism? Why didn't you say data justice uh, or something like this? Because feminism is a polarizing word, um, but we wanted to uh, claim feminism because first of all, it's like everything that we read was feminist. <laughs> you know, we were like drawing from uh, feminist uh, literature across a wide variety of fields. So to call it justice would have been like incorrect. I mean, just like not right exactly. Um, but also to say, to assert uh, feminism as being a useful framework for all of us. Uh, again, not it's like a framework and a way of thinking that and a body of work that is not only relevant for women, it's not only relevant for kind of women and gender minorities, um, but it's relevant for all of us and it points a path towards uh, liberation. So I still think there's a huge amount of stigma against the word feminism. And I know that there, we're seeing some really huge backlashes in different places right now against uh, feminist work, anything that is named as explicitly feminist. Um, we're not seeing as much of that, I would say, in the United States context, though there is some, but right now it's more racialized. So we're seeing a huge backlash and attack on things like critical race theory. Um, so the, these words that end up getting demonized by the right and then uh, weaponized and so on. Um, we're seeing a big one, actually, we we're just talking about this in my lab in uh, Korea right now. There's a huge backlash against um, feminism and feminists, anything kind of named explicitly as feminist. But I think there's a danger when we avoid the word that we allow 
those folks doing that weaponization, they, we allow them to claim the word and we allow them to paint it with these caricatures and stereotypes and stigmatizing narratives. Um, so I think the, the best thing we can do is to go out and be using it everywhere <laughs> with everybody um, and making it mainstream um, and making it part of discourse rather than going into the, the shadows and being afraid of using the term. Okay, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's kind of we appropriated the war and, the, and, and try to fight for, against the stigma. Okay, we are really short of time. So uh, there were two people that raised their hands, but we are going to ask you if you can write the, the question in the Q&A box, please. Okay. Mm. Oh, well. Yeah, what Carolina says is we have this word too, feminazi. Yeah, that's that's a word in the U.S. which has been used uh, to demonize, again, like weaponize, demonize uh, anyone who is um, self-described as feminist. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, um, we're really short of time. So just one more question. If everybody if anybody wants to write and if it's not um i will do one of my own <laughs> so i i was thinking like um which were the repercussions then when the, the, book, the book was published in 2020 and then pandemic came out so what happened uh, does anybody um some companies talk with you and Reen or other community, what was the impact? Sure. Yeah, yeah, it's been a super interesting process. I would say that um, there was a huge impact, which was in fact a little bit unexpected because we literally the day that the book came out, our book party was canceled because of COVID. Like that, the morning of the book party, <laughs> like the launch, uh, it was canceled. And we had all these, we had lined up these talks uh, for like book talks in that spring. All of those were canceled, obviously. So we we're feeling really depressed about it for like a month or two. But then the whole like Zoom thing started and Lauren had this great idea of doing a Zoom reading group for the book. Um, and so we ended up doing that right at, towards the beginning of the pandemic where each week we would uh, read and present about a chapter in data feminism. Um, that was a really kind of beautiful and wonderful experience of people coming together who were all isolated in their houses. Um, and, you know, I think it the book has traveled I, I, I think we aspired to reach folks in like Lauren's field, which is like digital humanities, in my field, which it was is sort of uh, data communication, uh, human computer interaction, uh, this kind of urban planning, now that I'm in urban planning. So we, we aspired to reach people there. But in fact, the book has traveled much more broadly. Um, and so we've been approached, I mean, we've had conversations with policymakers. We've had conversations, um, I would say fewer with companies, but many academic fields from, ranging from like design to law to policy, economics, bioinformatics, <laughs> um, you know, fields that are not ours. We're not, we would never say we're in bioinformatics um, because I think it just, it hit a chord right now as we are living in this data saturated society. And we're also starting to see more and more work about the harms that data uh, can enact and the data-driven products and apps and systems can enact. Um, at so many people are trying to think, how do we navigate this ethically and responsibly? Um, and so I think it sort of struck that nerve with people. So I think we've seen a lot of uptake. Um, and I think there's been a big impact with students as well. Um, we really wanted the book to be open access so that uh, teachers could assign it to students and it could be kind of like a, primer for a way to enter some of these debates around um, data and ethics and and also just how do we do things differently how can we mobilize an alternative vision that's not that data as the new oil vision but it's like an alternative vision of what is possible with data um, so yeah i think that's the other place that had a lot of impact mm, thanks excellent i mean the book is like traveling <laughs> all around the yeah. world yeah yeah well 
Thank you so much for being here and everybody for attend the, the meeting. It was really nice to, to have you. And thank you, Lilian, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Mike.